So the Amazon platform is very much mature. There's been a lot of opportunity with the aggregators that came in. It really like solidified Amazon as like a very solid business model where before I was like, ah, you're an Amazon seller. Now it's it's a little bit more considered. I, I really don't think anything has changed, but you know, it's, it's, it's more business, whatever that means, right? More accepted. Um, more accepted. That's a good way to put it. I like that. Welcome, fellow entrepreneurs, to the Amazon Sellers School Podcast, where we talk about Amazon and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode. We've got Elizabeth Green with us today. She is the founder of Jungler, and Jungler is an Amazon PPC agency helping you with everything related to ads and growing your business with ads. She's also a former Amazon seller, so she started out in the Amazon game before moving into focusing on ads. And in my opinion, the biggest superpower of all, she's a mother of six children age five to 13, which is amazing. I have one, so I can only imagine having six. So God bless you on that for sure. Uh, Elizabeth, I appreciate you coming on the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about how you got into this crazy Amazon game? Yeah, first off, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. And yeah, I'm like back in the day. So yeah, six kids. uh, And we were working to figure out some way to make money from home. I was at home with our kids, stay at home mom and wanted to be able to bring my husband into that wonderful, messy world of being at home all the time. And uh, so of course, you know, there's so much opportunity, I think even more so. So it's almost like there's so much opportunity. Where do you even start? Mm-hmm. Um, like there, you know, you can flip things on eBay. You can all, all of the above, right? One, the good one is selling on Amazon. So we figured out, okay, so there's this thing called retail arbitrage, which is where you go and you find products that are physically in stores. And then you would sell them for a little bit more on the Amazon platform bonus there is that somebody else doesn't have to go to the store. You did that. So I did mm-hmm. that. Dragging all four kids along for no, Yes, four at the time because we got a two for one at the end of that with twins. And then that was a bit much. So we're like, okay, (laughs) that's a bit much. Oh, there's this thing called private labeling, which is you create your own products and then sell them on the the platform, which is fantastic. Okay, I can stay at home and I can message people and I can coordinate. And so we worked in on that. Got pregnant with twins. That was a whole thing. Uh, Double the babies, double the morning sickness. Business kind of went to the wayside a little bit. And then once we sort of picked our heads up out of the water, I want to say quite a a couple months into actually them being born because double the newborns as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went to go get back on the horse. And so I was in a lot of the Facebook groups. And the one thing I really love about the Amazon community is just how generous everyone is with like strategies and ideas. And obviously nobody's sharing products in the private label world, but up until the point of products, if somebody finds a new hack, a new button, a new thing, it's almost like they're like, they can't wait to tell somebody else about that so they can take yeah, advantage sure. as well, which is amazing. And so with that, a lot of, I was in those Facebook groups as well. So people were having questions about advertising. Turns out I really like the advertising piece of it. I think it's a beautiful blend between data and creativity that I personally just find very intriguing. And so um, when people had questions, I happen to have the answers to those. And so I would just I have answers, you know, I want to be generous as well, as much as everyone's given to me. And so that led to someone saying, Hey, do you do this? And I was like, sure. <laughs> why not? <laughs> right. Uh, it turns out I was really good at it. And it turns out that I really loved it. I happened to weirdly enough, really like spreadsheets. Never before did I actually like do anything with spreadsheets prior to selling on Amazon. Uh, all of the data is in spreadsheets. So I learned really quickly, really fast. Um, And then it really has just been going from there. So my entire thesis on growth has been just give without expectation of return, um, which hopefully I can do here today. And then it always seems to come back. Yeah, that's awesome. And, And so you've been running Jungler officially for how long now? 
Yeah, it's been six or seven years now. Six or seven years. Very good. So that's a that's a long time in the e-commerce world for sure. And uh, so you've been uh, essentially started like a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, somebody asked you, hey, could you do this? And you're like, sure, why not? And now you've blown up into a, a full PPC agency serving clients all over the place, which is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great. So... We're going to dive in today what people should be focusing on in their PPC. Now, a lot of people are focusing on ACOS and tacos. And if you're just focusing on those, you can really be missing a larger part of the puzzle. So we're really going to dive into what people should be looking at in their PPC to really maximize and grow their market share for their product. So where do you want to start with that, uh, uh, with the ACOS, tacos? Let's go ahead and dive into that. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to talk with, with ACOS. I think with that, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about the evolution of the advertising platform, which I definitely went through. Because I remember the conversations that happened when I was having those first conversations. The questions were, hey, do I need to run advertising? Like, and if I do, you know, maybe how, there's a little bit of tidbits. And, um, now the question is, how do I run advertising? It's like a huge integral piece of the business. Was Amazon getting rid of search find buys? Like pretty much PPC mm-hmm. only launches are definitely a thing now. And so with that, with that evolution it also came an additional complexity. So in the beginning, it was like, you know, you could do the old school, start with autos, move to manuals, or, you know, you could slowly inch into it. Or it's like, where do I even start? Ah, you pretty much like there's two options, right? <laughs> and start with this one. These days, the, the complexity just seems to be exponential. In addition to that, there's been just a real uptick of one Amazon putting more advertising placements on their platform, which mm-hmm. is great for Amazon, sure. also means there's less organic spots. So it's much harder to, you know, much more competitive game these days and much more of a pay to play type system. And then the other one is it it just, again, the increase in competition. So the Amazon platform is very much mature. There's been a lot of opportunity with the aggregators that came in. It really like solidified Amazon as like a very solid business model where before I was like, ah, you're an Amazon seller. Now it's, it's a little bit more considered, I, I really don't think anything has changed, but you know, it's, it's, it's more business, whatever that means. Right. More accepted. Um, more accepted. That's a good way to put it. I like that. And, and, but so with all of that, what has happened with the increase in competition, the increase in complexity, and then just the increase in fees and just the current market being what it is, the bottom line is getting squeezed more and more. Well, the mm-hmm. problem is in that sellers find is there's this tension between if you're, if you're a private label seller, you have to grow off your own merit. You're not enterprise. You can't say like, Hey, let's throw 25 grand at it. Let's see what happens and optimize from there. Like that's no, you, if you do that, you're going to be completely out of business. And so there's this like tension and necessity to figure out a way to be able to still grow your business. Cause that's the other factor is that Amazon advertising will grow your business. It will lead to organic market share. The question is, can you do it in a way that is going to be beneficial to the business long-term and not completely destroy cash flow. So you end up in six months and you're like, oh, great, I have no runway. I can't grow. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's really where we find if you don't take like a more, the buzzword probably is like a holistic view to advertising or basically like how does advertising lead to these other growth factors that are not strictly within ad console. And so what we find is that any sellers who are specifically focused on ad console as like their only metrics will oftentimes, again, due to the rising competition, due to the complexity, will lead them to make decisions that hurt that long-term growth strategy. And so why it's it's a problem if you like only focus in on ACOS or you're only focusing on ROAS on other marketing platforms, that makes total sense, right? Because you're only looking at that one specific platform. It's not like it leads to additional growth factors. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you might be looking at, say, customer lifetime value in those cases, which makes total sense. But the thing is that with the Amazon platform, customer lifetime value actually extrapolates out to like additional shoppers finding you not just that one shopper repeat purchase and so what we find is that it really takes 
again, taking like a broader, more long-term view to what your advertising is doing, a good barometer for that tends to be tacos is a good one because I give that plays into like profitability metrics. The other one that we would look at, we call um, like the ratio of ads to organic, we call it ad sale percentage. So like ad sales divided by total sales, like what percentage of my total sales is being like, do I have to rely on ads to generate? So, mm-hmm. of course, the higher that number, the more reliant you are on your ads, the less you have the organic. So it's like looking at how is my advertising today influencing better numbers tomorrow and just making sure that you're working towards that instead of, yep. again, like a hyper narrow focus that you'll wake up in three months and go, oh, wait, I have no organic market share to speak of. And then you are kind of end up stuck. Yeah, so you you mentioned that you want to not only focus on the numbers inside the ad console. So is there a specific place that you're pulling information from as well and then kind of merging it with the ad console data? Yeah, so really the two things that we would merge together would be business reports and then like whatever ad console data. I'll be honest here. I'm like historically, I told you I love spreadsheets. Like I'm a DIY kind of girly. So back in the day, I was, you know, trying to build out systems and some sort of automation to be able to marry these reports. Nowadays, I'll be honest, software really does shine here when it comes to analytics. So we've Mm -hmm. adopted a platform and been using it for, I believe, over two years now. There's plenty of platforms in the market. We just really happen to like this solution where you you do want some way to be able to clearly see your advertising data and your sales data together. Also, Mm -hmm. other helpful data points would be things like profitability and net profits, bonus points, if you can marry those. Other things that is helpful to keep tabs on. And this is something that we were working on building before we're like, oh, we can just get an out of box solution and save ourselves the headache on automations is inventory. Because for example, you don't want to be like pushing a product where inventory is running out. Um, If you have the product come back in stock, you want to be able to move quickly. And unfortunately, as much as we love our clients, they oftentimes tell us like, oh yeah, by the way, that product's going to run out of stock. Like if we didn't have access to that in like real time to be able to track, um, Mm -hmm. we just, we found we couldn't move as quickly as we needed to, to really help them make sure their ad strategy was supporting inventory positions. And so software here has been really helpful for us. Okay. Are you able to share the name of the software? Yeah, or? no, absolutely. I love them. It's called Kapok, K-A-P-O-Q. It, uh, to be honest, okay. it's essentially built for like full service agencies. So there's a lot of solutions yeah. and automations in there. Um, we just found that the way that they have their analytics set up and the way that we can slice and dice things, um, we've pretty much preferred it over any other platform we've tested so far. Okay. But essentially what it's doing is it's just pulling all that data that you could download in reports and use spreadsheets and merging it all together for you in a nice dashboard and easy to access it all together. Yeah. So the problem with doing this manually is Amazon will back update data, which becomes like, so even if you had Mm. like an army of VAs going through and like copying and pasting and putting everything together every single day and you were like super on it, you would actually have to go back and like retroactively update stuff probably at least 30 days back, which Mm -hmm. as you can imagine is a very hard lift. And so it's much easier if you have like API access to do that. I just didn't want to have to fully build the software. Yeah, for sure. So let's, uh, let's keep it super simple. Let's say I'm a a seller and I'm going to launch one product. It's my first product ever. I just brought in a thousand units. They're on their way into Amazon. And what, how would you recommend that I set up campaigns, the initial, initial launch campaigns for a product like that? Of course, it's mm, going to depend a- on the category. So let's say we're in a uh, uh, sports and outdoors category. Mm, good question. So, Trying to think of which way to tackle it first. Maybe I'll tackle good campaign structure and then I'll tackle how you go about like the launch because the campaign Mm -hmm. structure will bleed over into pretty much all ad strategies and then the launch gets a little bit more specific. Um, Good campaign structure, what we found is really about control. We like single campaign, single ad group structures. There's specific reasons why. There's a lot of people in the space who'll say like, you have to have a certain X amount of keywords. I don't think that's right. I think it's bogus. But I would say I wouldn't want over 
20 to 50 keywords, we find that that kind of dilutes things a little bit. Really what you find with this structure is if you threw everything together in one huge conglomerate campaign, like you threw all of your products in and all of the keywords and you had 20 different ad groups and it was this whole structure, I'll be honest, it's not, there's a lot of people in the space who say like, oh, it's because it has poor performance. That's not actually true. Um, sometimes actually when you create, I lovingly call them Franken campaigns because they're mm-hmm. like this mishmash of everything. Sometimes those are your best performing campaigns. And it can be very, very frustrating to be honest sometimes. Um, but the reason why that would not quote be like, I don't want to say a good structure, but the best structure is when you find something in that campaign, you're like, oh my goodness, this keyword is phenomenal. And this one product works really well. And this one ad group is like, the A cost is amazing. I would love to put more ad dollars here. You can't because Mm -hmm. budgets are set at the campaign level and all products within that ad group will be advertised on whatever keywords you have in that ad group at whatever bid you have. So you end up with this big structure that you might have really good things within that structure that you can't like put more emphasis behind, put more ad dollars behind. So from a control perspective or a scaling perspective, you end up having to almost like rebuild the whole structure to fix it. So if you can avoid that on launch, I highly suggest you do that. And okay. So that would be one campaign, one ad group, and then only advertising. I'm not above putting multiple variations into a single ad group. There's pros and cons to that. We actually kind of group them, but where we specify is on a per listing level. So for child variations, you can think of listings in some ways as landing pages. So Mm -hmm. you think about it, if you were running a traditional ad somewhere else, would you be sending that traffic to two separate landing pages when you didn't have control over like where that traffic was going? No, you probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so that would be another way to think about the advertising. Okay. So, and so you have a single campaign and then the ad groups underneath that is each ad group, like a separate keyword. Or how are you breaking out those groups? Yeah, so we would do one ad group because, again, the budget filters to all ad groups. Um, And then we tend to group uh, match types into their own campaigns. So you have like one here, one there. Reason being Uh, is when you start adding negatives and things, you can get kind of messy if you like lump match types together in those things. And so... The difference is then you have to decide. So that's the structure. You have your products. Also, I would start with sponsored product ads. I don't care how big your budget is. Like we have brands that are spending, any of you are spending like $100,000 a month or something or above that. By far, I think like at least 80, minimum 75% of your ad spend is probably going to be going to sponsored products. So Mm -hmm. should you run the other ad types? Yes. But on product launch, you should be fine, especially if you have a smaller budget and you really need to focus in that budget. I would recommend sponsored product ads. Um, They also have the most impact on organic ranking, which is typically going to be your goal upon launch. Mm -hmm. And then the difference is going to be uh, what keywords do you choose? That is probably the biggest one. And so our research goes around um, where does the product fit into the market? Ideally... You should have, if you sourced your product really well, already have an idea of where that product fits in the market. But actually what your listing SEO is going to be. So if you've gotten like work from a company who did the listing for you, maybe your team, you might have a list of keywords. Uh, SEO and Amazon advertising like keywords will differ because oftentimes you'll put like broader keywords or like more high volume keywords in your SEO. Those may not be the best to go after upon launch. Sure. Really what you want to look at is just take a good hard look at where does my product fit in the market? A great way to do this. We still do this when we're doing keyword research. Uh, it's manual, but you can go to the, go on Amazon, type in that search and say like, does my product fit on the search page? Um, the more the product fits on the search page, the more you can be pretty certain that your specific product is the type of product that those shoppers are looking for. Because rank is determined in a lot of ways by sales velocity and high conversions. So if there's high sales velocity, high conversions for like products, you can say like, well, these are being purchased through this keyword. And so we really just want to find like, where can we best fit in the market? And then the other thing that not a lot is, I'm trying to get this message out here a little bit, is when you're also curating that keyword list, you should be filtering it based on your available budget. 
Um, oftentimes what I see from like new sellers is they'll say, oh, like, you know, they'll go on YouTube and it's not like it was a bad launch strategy, but someone's like, all right, you got to find like 200 keywords and you got to make these five campaigns and then you got to, you know, put all this stuff up, put them in really high bids, be super aggressive out of the gate. And then they go there and they put that up there and they're like, oh my gosh, I just spent like $200 <laughs> in the first 24 hours and my entire ad budget for the week was like a hundred dollars. Like yeah. it doesn't work. And so the way that you kind of figure out where this lies with your account is you can look at the cost per clicks. Helium 10 for the US only, but it will have the average cost per or Amazon suggested bids. You also can, before you even launch your products, providing you have those ASINs in there, you can go, I call it creating like a dummy campaign, meaning you're going to like act like you're going to create a campaign, but you won't actually click launch. So you're not going to spend anything. You can go and add those products in, add the keywords you want, and it will actually show you the suggested bids. So these are rough estimates. Anyone who's doing advertising for any length of time is like, yeah, those are not exactly accurate and it's mm-hmm. you're right but they are the closest we're going to get to accuracy before we hit go um and so that will give you an idea so let's say i had a daily budget of a hundred dollars and i look at one keyword and it's like five dollars well five dollars a click that adds up really fast i can only afford so many clicks so maybe there's something else that's going to make sense of me or sense for me so what we find is like it's a bit art it's a bit science it is mathematics at the end of the day. I like spreadsheets. You can like forecast out these things. I find it fun. But it's like, okay, so how many clicks can I afford at whatever the averages are going to be? And then like, okay, so if I can only afford, if you can only afford five keywords, I would much prefer you say, all right, these are my five keywords. I'm going to advertise on these ones. I'll get the sales to be able to work up and add more later. But if I can keep my budget active for the entire day on five keywords, that's going to get me way farther than if I can only afford like two hours of activity because I pick 50 keywords. Yep. Yep. For sure. So uh, Helium 10 is what you guys are using to find those keywords for products typically? Yeah. Helium 10 is a good OG. Another one that we've uh are getting into using as well is viral launch. Um, there's plenty of them out there. Another great ones. I mean, even just Amazon suggested keywords, again, take everything with a grain of salt, filter it through your own, like understanding of your products. Don't take Mm -hmm. anything at face value that goes for helium 10 viral launch or any other out there. Yeah. And that's a a key thing that you're saying there too. If, uh, you're launching a product, make sure you know and understand the market. And that's where, you know, having some type of background in whatever product you're launching is very helpful because you're going to know the the terminology and the different words that people use a lot better than someone who's just grabbing random products and trying to sell them. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So you've got all the keywords in there. You've got the campaign set, the, the budgets are running and your products start moving. Uh, do you guys have a strategy for using auto campaigns versus frank phrase campaigns and exact campaigns? Yep. So I would say there's a lot of talk in the space. I don't know if it's like kind of old school or just for whatever reason. And like autos are like only good for keyword research. And then, you know, broad match or the old school, like, okay, autos are kind of like the beginning. And then we do broad and then we do phrase and we do exact. I would say we don't treat any, we don't really ever treat any campaign as like, quote, it's only ever good for research. And that's all we'll ever use it for. Because what we've seen is that auto campaigns can create a lot of really good low cost traffic it's very easy to get lower cost per clicks and autos. Hmm. Not necessarily so much with exact match. Broad match the same way. Now there has been updates to the algorithm on the search terms that broad match will pull. And so I will be, if you haven't been aware of the update and you haven't checked your search term reports for your broad match recently, like go check those. You probably have a lot of negatives to add. Okay. Um, so you definitely want to keep up with these things. What we've actually observed, because I've done gosh, probably thousands of audits at this point. And so I've seen 
every type of ad structure, even ad structures you would like never in a million years think to put in an account. And I've seen accounts that go to one extreme or another. So one extreme would be exact match only. We're only going to focus on rank strategies. It's all rank. That's all good ads are for. We're, we're not going to do, you know, there's a common sentiment that I hear often. It's like, I've found all the keywords in my space. So why do I need autos? Why do I need broad, right? Yeah. Research, keyword research. What we've actually seen, again, because I've audited, they come to me when things are in trouble and that's when they want the audit. So I see it like at the end of that, you know, maybe six months later, maybe even a year later. And so I'll audit those accounts. I'm like, oh, well, there's only exact match. The, the interesting thing about the accounts that go to the extreme of exact match is they will be really, they'll have really good rankings on main keywords. Again, because that's the sole focus of these accounts. But the funny thing is they actually struggle with market share. So they struggle to grow sales because they struggle with the volume of traffic, i.e. sessions that they need to really hit their sales goals. And then you have the flip side, which is the people who are like, for whatever reason, they stuck up an auto, they stuck up broad, and they never did anything else with it. So there's relatively no exact match, maybe one or two, and they tried it and they're like, the cost is too high, I can't. So for whatever reason, it's like other extreme, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all broads, it's all autos. Those ones, interesting enough, um, they do kind of okay with like a oftentimes profitability is not terrible. Now, sometimes these can have like really crazy swings as well, just due to the search terms they pull and stuff. But these ones struggle with ranking and struggle to really maintain the market share. And so what we've discovered again through audits and testing ourselves is that you really need both. It's not an either or strategy, it's an and strategy. Mm-hmm. And so our goal is to have those specific campaigns that are designed to help us maintain that rank to help us maintain the presence on, you know, support our presence on those main key terms that we know our customers are searching for and we need to make sure that we maintain, you know, some sort of rank there. But on the flip side, we also want to have those autos, those bras. Now, our goal here is low cost traffic. Fun fact, you're actually... Some people, when they look at how they're doing in the market, some people will look at ranking on main keywords, but another great barometer for how you're doing is BSR. BSR is completely agnostic to your rank. It doesn't matter. We've actually been able, because we wanted a quick turnaround, we had one account where we dropped, we were number one BSR and we got down to number two and we're like, we need to get back to number one. What we did was went into the account. We're like, where are the sales coming from? Let's just pump that. We got back to number one BSR within, I want to say it was two days with less than a point increase in total ACOS simply through leveraging broads and autos because we needed that fast, quick, like influx of sales to gain BSR. So there's more than one way to go about it. And what I would say is if you're like hyper focused in on one, like very narrow strategy, oftentimes you're missing, um, you're missing one half. Yeah, so probably experiment, right, with the mm-hmm. autos, phrases, exact, broads, and don't just completely eliminate one or the other just because you think that would be the best. Yep. So with those auto campaigns and you're, when you're moving keywords to exact matches or phrase matches, you're not uh, putting them as a negative in the auto campaigns or anything, unless maybe they're doing really bad for some reason in an auto campaign. Right. So I definitely recommend negating if you have poor performance, like why I have clicks that are not converting. Right. Yeah. But in terms of uh, negating something that is working, no, we don't negate when we um, would toss it in another match type or another campaign. The reason why is... <laughs> This is an infuriating thing about Amazon advertising. Like every ad platform has its nuances. This is one of the nuances of Amazon advertising is you would think if you put the exact same keyword, the exact same product, the exact same everything, exact same bids, like replicate it to a T. Even if you go into Ad Console now and you copy one of your existing campaigns and pause the original, you will not be able to replicate that exact performance for whatever reason I don't know. I just know what happens. And so if we're if we're launching it in another match type or moving it to an exact because we recognize that there's a lot of potential here, what we don't want to do is cut off that good performance. Now, do we want to have most of the impressions probably coming through exact because we want to get super noted and, and you know more aggressive here? Yes, that would be the case. And so one thing we actually use um, internal 
tools for our bid optimizations. One of the reason was, is we wanted a lot of control over these things. And one of the things that we actually implemented in our bidding system is to make sure that our bidding system is being more aggressive with the more specific match types. And Mm -hmm. we're being less aggressive when we increase things. And when we decrease something, because it's not working, like yeah, sometimes we, we need to be aggressive on the downward. But as far as the upward trends and where we're pushing that traffic to, we want to be more selective with our more narrow folk, like our narrow targeting types. So that okay. is something that we do. So like we don't get rid of it, but we will try and control it through bids. Okay. So if I understood that right, let, let's say you've got a keyword that's doing good in an auto campaign you will maybe move that to a phrase or an exact campaign and possibly have a higher bid so that the ad sales start going through the exact campaign or phrase campaign more than the auto campaign? Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I remember for sure a lot of people teaching that process where you start everything in auto, then you move it to phrase, negate it in the auto, and then you go from phrase and move them to exact, negate them in the auto and the phrase. Um, but yeah, like then you kind of pigeonhole yourself in with those keywords and you never know, things can change. People might start searching for things differently. The Amazon platform can change. New keywords that uh, you didn't see before might pop up. And so you kind of always got to have those various different Mm -hmm. ad versions going so that you're always on top of those different changes. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. There's a lot of things like that process of negating in the original or, you know, other strategies I've heard that like you hear them, you're like, that makes total sense, Mm -hmm. right? Like, why would I not pause that to make sure that I'm like getting more specific and exact and really controlling things. So there's a lot of these strategies that like in theory, I would hundred percent agree with. And most of my, if you ever hear me have like a very hard stance on anything, like specific, like the whole exact and broad thing or, you know, not negating all, I will, I will stand on a soapbox on these, on these issues. But the reason why is because I've tried the alternatives and like, I like to say any, any good ad manager who's been at it for a while, if you have a really strong stance on something, it's probably because you have battle scars. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so a lot of the, the stances or the ways that we look at stuff is like, I've been doing this for a long time. And so it means I've got a lot of battle scars and I've seen a lot of like negative repercussions of some of these things. And so I do my best to try and, you know, just again, be helpful and say like, Hey, this is what could potentially happen. This is what I've seen happen. I've seen some really bad repercussions of these things. And so I would not recommend it. You know, are you going to completely screw up your account? I mean, you can always go through an archive negative. So Mm -hmm. You can always rewrite that if you need to, but I would say more often than not, I've seen it hurt an account more than it helps. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You got to be careful with your ads. You, uh, it's, it's an, not an exact science all the time. You're, it's a kind of a creative art as well. So you got to be feeling things out and constantly be changing and seeing things where things are, are going with the platform. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's one thing that we've really tried to build in in our team, you know, as I've kind of uh, stepped away from a little bit more of the day to day is in this industry, it moves so fast. And so it's, it's so hard to like, create a specific SOP for everything. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And so the way that we've kind of about, gone about it is like you are going to have your standard best practices, right? Like the thing, like make sure you're checking for your negatives, make sure you're adjusting bids. Are you going through your budgets? Are you reviewing these things? Like, are you tracking ranking? Are you checking the account daily just to see if there's a fire? Like, there's those good standard, like we know that these practices should happen. But what happens when those practices don't? necessarily work or you don't see that working or in a difficult account, like say um, a low conversion rate, high price product. Those are, you will see one day a 2% ACoS and the next day is a hundred percent ACoS and back down to five. And you're like, what, do I optimize for the two or do I optimize <laughs> for the hundred? Right. Yeah. Or supplement campaigns, right. Advertising a supplement. You're like, I have a $10 cost per click. How in the, like, 
what do I, what do I do in these scenarios? Like this is, this is very different. Someone else told me I should like leave this for a week. I can't afford to let a $10 cost per click run for a week. Like what do I, what do I do? And so what we have done is just get a team of, you know, battle hardened Amazon ad managers. And we, we have our standard processes, but what we do is really, we really, instead of like that top down, like super SOP structure, we consider it almost like a bottom up approach. So when we have an ad manager who's faced with, with, you know, those issues of we've done that with the low conversion rate and the high price point products. And we saw those swings. So what did we do? We went into the account, we troubleshoot it. And we said, you know what? I think if we looked at longer date ranges, it smooths out these humps and we can make optimizations here. And, you know, we tried that and it really worked. So we're like, okay, this works now team. Now we have a playbook for this or the high cost per clicks. We're like, the cost of testing is so high. We can't afford to test thousands of keywords. Mm -hmm. So we did frequent micro tests. We test those high cost per clicks. As soon as we know something works, something doesn't, we pivot immediately, quickly. It doesn't take us seven days. It takes us as soon as we get the data, we work on it. And so we're like, that playbook works really well. And it helps us. So there's a playbook for that. What about highly seasonal? What happens when you have a Mother's Day product? And you're like, I got five days to make my entire year's sales on this one product line. What do we do here? Right. And so it's just, it's working through those specific scenarios and then, you know, just again, bringing the wealth of knowledge on Amazon advertising. See, like, I know how the system works. And because I know how the system works, it's much easier to create like a strategy to get around those roadblocks. And then, you know, just try and do our best to educate when we find out the answers. Yep. Now, uh, a question that uh, I just thought of that uh, people might ask uh, if we're leaving the same keywords in, let's say, let's say it's in all three in auto, a phrase and an exact. Aren't those going to be competing with each other and driving up the bid for that keyword? That is a good question. So Amazon did uh, a share in their literature that no, you won't be bidding against yourself in terms of driving up the bid. Now, I will say in terms of like the impressions, right? So if one search term triggers this impression and one search term triggers that impression, you will have that overlap. So I don't think you can get around it. However, you won't you won't drive up your own cost per clicks. Mm-hmm. So you can be perfectly fine with that. Yep. Yeah, that's what I figured the answer would be. But uh, I know a lot of people are concerned. Yeah. It's about a good that question. And, yeah. I mean, I, I would be concerned as well. You're like, great, I'm bidding two dollars here and fifty cents here. Do I just did I just jack up my fifty cent bid somewhere? Like, you know, that wouldn't be great. Yep. Exactly. And so. If you're doing these ad campaigns, should ad campaigns always be profitable? If they're not at the level that you want them to be, should you just be pausing them or how do you deal with that kind of stuff? Yeah, so that goes back to our original topic on making sure that you're making good forward thinking decisions. Because at the end of the day, like if you if you want something to be profitable, i.e. lower A costs is what we're talking about here because we're an ad console. The real, the main lever, the one real thing you can do is lower the bids. Well, what happens when you lower bids? You're not as competitive in the ad auction and you show lower in search. When you show lower in search, you get less impressions, which means you get less clicks, which means you get less orders, which oftentimes will absolutely tank your rankings. Mm -hmm. So I I hear oftentimes from like new sellers are like, great, I launched these things. Everything was great. I went into optimize because that's what I should be doing because like, I'm getting the orders, but now my ACOS is too high. And then like all of a sudden my sales just are gone. <laughs> Nowhere to be found, right? It's because you you were no longer competitive and you weren't showing up where you needed to on the platform. But then like, what do you do about that, right? Because you're like, I can't learn at a loss forever, but then I need ranking. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of stuck. And so in these cases, what we've done is we'll identify those key terms that are important to the product mm-hmm. where the goal is ranking. And for those specific campaigns and for those specific keywords, yes, we probably will be running at a loss for that one keyword. Now we're going to be tracking our rankings. Like if you are my, our whole hypothesis and not hypothesis, but how we would go about it, I guess our approach would be if we're going to be losing money somewhere advertising, we need to be making it up somewhere else. It never makes sense to run at a loss if you're not going to have like even some long-term benefits from doing that. So in these cases, it's I'm going to achieve rankings. I know it's a loss on this on this one term, 
But if I can make sure that that's leading to my organic rankings, if I'm seeing the increase in my sales volume, then those losses are offset by my organic orders, which organic orders are pure profit. You don't mm-hmm. have to pay for those. So you can you can make sure that the account is winning overall. So there will be some key terms. Now, should you always lose all the time on all of your ads? No, I don't think so. So that's why we have sort of, and that also helps offset the account, right? Because if we have that exact match, super specific rank strategy, like we had talked about, well, then if I have my lower costs, broads, autos, those ones I'm running for profitability. I don't like losing money on auto campaigns. I don't really like losing money on broad match campaigns or those ones because my goal there is low cost traffic. And so I want to push as much low cost traffic at as much high profitability as I possibly can into the account. So you get that influx of traffic, you're not losing on it. And then that can also offset those like more high cost, lower profitability um, ads. And then ideally everything should balance out. Again, we talked about things are complicated. Not everything's as straightforward as we want it to be. Um, but you want to see that graph up and to the right. Um, and then that sales trend, again, is going to offset that ad spend. And that's where tracking total A cost can be very effective because as ads, as total sales grow, if ad spend remains consistent, total A cost will go down. Yeah. And it's it also depends too, right? What market you're in, what category mm-hmm. and how competitive it is and what the lifetime value of your customers are. You know, yep. in supplements, for example, you've got a, a very high lifetime value of a customer once you capture them. So it's probably a good chance that a lot of your ad campaigns are going to be losing mm-hmm. money because you're losing money on the front end to make it up on those reorders and subscribe and save and things like that. Yep, absolutely. I mean, the good news about if you're talking subscribe and save for those reorders, those do show up in the business reports. And so if you're tracking total A costs, you will see the total A cost decrease because of that. So again, total A cost, it's a really quick barometer to see like, hey, how do my ads play into my overall profitability? Because if I have a quick and dirty rough, rough napkin math, I always say like, use an actual calculator, make sure you're tracking your numbers actually, like you want your true net profit numbers. But if you want quick and dirty napkin math in terms of how does my ads play into my profitability, I get a 30% margin on a product, I got a 10% total A cost number, 30 minus 10, 20, I got a rough 20% profit at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't always work out like that. There's like inventory fee, there's storage fees, like all those things sneak up on you. And if you're only tracking that math and you're like, I think it's 30% and I think it like track your numbers, right? But if you wanted like, again, rough napkin math to know that um, you can do that quick calculation. Yep. Yeah, you got to remember all those extra costs. Uh, yes. A lot of people, especially if they're new, they don't add in all those additional costs, even as basic as like adding a label to a product or something mm-hmm. like that. If you're not tracking those costs, that uh, those can add up really fast. And fees, 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 always more fees. So got to yeah. watch all of that. So uh, are there any anything else that we haven't talked about that uh, most people are probably not aware of that they maybe should be watching for in their ads or doing in their ads um, anything that's you know not not everybody might know out there yeah all one thing that we found a lot of benefit from and again going back to battle scars and school of hard knocks like we've been managing uh clothing brands for quite some time i think about five years now four or five years and one thing with clothing brands is there's a large amount of products like mm-hmm. i'm talking like yes tens of thousands of skews 20 000, 50, some, 000 so yes i know yeah and you're like ah, okay i need to manage ads for this how do i keep track of it where do i put my energy right i know i have the wheels spinning but what's under the hood and where are the pieces broken right um and so what we found to be really useful here is one again tracking things on a parent agent level or a listing level to be helpful there are certain interactions between SKUs on the ad side that can lead you to like some um misleading numbers i guess you would say if you're looking at a SKU or child lacing level so that makes that a little bit simpler so you went from you know what twenty thousand skews to maybe you have like a hundred per listing or something Mm -hmm. but the other thing that we found very helpful is good ads good ad strategy really is good ad spend allocation at the end of the day 
Where am I putting my odd dollars? Are those odd dollars working for me? And so one thing that we found very helpful, again, marrying business reports and advertising data, is to look at a calculation of our total account broken down by listings. Um, we want to look at the total sales. Sessions are helpful here as well, as well as unit session percentage on a listing level. And this is the thing that was really helpful for me to understand. Oftentimes, we know our best products, right? But like, this is the top seller, second best seller. But do you know by how much? What piece, like how big of the piece of the pie is it? And yep. so that can be very helpful to look at percentages of total here. So this top seller, I mean, like if you have a particular product where 80% of the total sales is coming from that one product, your account lives or dies by that product. Mm -hmm. You better keep a very close eye on that, right? Versus we've seen accounts where it's like the top 10 products, it's like 10%, you know, 8%, 20%. There are all those products where it's just kind of split across everything, but it's very helpful to know. But then from an advertising side, what we like to do is look at the ad spend for every single listing. And then you want to calculate, you need other metrics like ad sales, uh, like ad conversion rate as well. And those also allow you to calculate things like um, ad uh, a cost, total a cost, when we call ad sale percentage. And we find is if you can break all these numbers again out on a listing level, and then also take your ad spend and look at the percentages of total here. This is very quick easy math. Now compiling these reports takes a little finesse. You got to do a little spreadsheet work, but if you can, then you can say like, well, okay. Um, my top product is driving 25% of sales, but like, wait, I'm only allocating 15% of my ad resources here. Mm -hmm. mm, maybe there's a misalignment there. Maybe you're just pulling back because you want more organic or something, but you know, at least look at those numbers. You would be surprised at how many accounts I audit where I'm like, um, you have this one product that's like 8% of your total sales and you're spending like 25% of your total budget. Is there a reason for this? Oftentimes what I find is because it's lumped. We talked about like not being able to really control things when it's those franking campaigns. The reason why is because oftentimes they're just thrown into campaigns like that and you don't really know what the split is. You don't know where your ad resources are going. So just that saying, what is it bringing in? What am I allocating towards it is very helpful. And then you can take it a step further to look at your A cost, total A cost ad sale percentage and say, okay, so I'm allocating 40% of my ad budget to this product. What is the performance of that ad budget? A cost, total A cost ad sale percentage. Then I can say, well, 40% of my ad budget is running at a 25% total A cost, AKA a loss. Maybe I better go fix the ads for that one product. Or, mm -hmm. wow, this one product, my main product, 40% of total sales. I'm only allocating 15% of my ad budget. Wait, I'm like super profitable. I got a 6% total A cost. Why am I not putting more resources here, right? So when it comes to like, especially these larger complex brands where you're like, I know I have like all my background processes, my SOP spinning, but really to do that strategic work, what new campaign should I launch? Where should I dig in? What needs optimization? What needs a second look? It can be very hard to see the forest for the trees in the ad console, where if you have like a report or something that you compile like this to look at it, say, oh, instead of saying I need to fix everything in the entire account, totally cost is up. It's a mess. You go, oh, I need to fix these two products and I probably need to allocate more resources to one. And then everybody talks about the 80-20. You find mm -hmm. the 80-20 quite quickly if you know how to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's super good idea and important to look at the, what products are selling the most, mm -hmm. you're bringing in the most money from and make sure your ad spend is related and not, you know, way lower than what those products actually should be. Mm -hmm. It's a very good idea. All right. Awesome. Well, Elizabeth, uh, this has been fantastic. If people want to reach out to you and get more information, how can they connect with you? Yeah. So best place, if you're interested in working with us, definitely going to be the website, um, which is jungler.com, J-U-N-G-L-R.com. Um, if you are interested in just like, hey, I want to learn more from you about advertising. Best place to follow me would definitely be LinkedIn. Yes, I would I would uh, recommend LinkedIn as well. You put out a lot of good stuff. I think that's where we actually got connected yeah. as well. So definitely follow you on LinkedIn and uh, you know, start learning more about PPC and hopefully improve your business. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Elizabeth, I appreciate the time. Of course. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a great one. You too. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, 
Success is yours if you take it.